part, which is called the Krebs cycle, right? So if there's oxygen, it's going to go this route, right? So the pyruvate's going to get processed, right? And we'll talk more about this, like, so you'll know what, exactly what that means in a, in a second. But then the pyruvates or the processed pyruvates, which are called, they become these, these molecules called acetyl-CoA. Um, those enter this thing called the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle. All right, so glycolysis, if there's oxygen, the pyruvate gets processed and then it goes into the Krebs cycle. And then the Krebs cycle um, processes those two, um, the, the, the acetyl-CoA's releases oxygen, um, produces NADH, and it produces FADH2, which are also those like, kind of like um, NADPH in photosynthesis. So they're electron carriers. And then those, carry the electrons to um, the electron, a similar electron transport team is very similar to photosynthesis, but there are some crucial differences. So you should definitely like make sure you, you know, pay attention to the differences. But um, basically this is the route if there's oxygen, right? All right. If there's no oxygen available in the environment, then glycolysis still happens. So glycolysis is considered anaerobic because it doesn't require oxygen. But then in this case, if there's no oxygen, um, it undergoes this process called fermentation. Have you guys heard about that term fermentation? I'm sure you have, right? So like fermentation is, it's basically breaking down these like pyruvates. It uses these pyruvates that were produced during glycolysis, but it doesn't use oxygen. So it can't produce as much energy as this whole process can, right? So it still is a way of getting ATP out of sugar molecules, but it's much less efficient than um, than actual like you know aerobic cellular respiration. So fermentation is usually um, performed by certain any like actually a lot of organisms can do fermentation, right? Um, and it depends on what type of organism you are and and like what the product is going to be, right? So there are things called obligate anaerobes. Have you guys, have we talked about that? We talked about like um, bacteria who are obligate anaerobes. Do you remember what that means? What does obligate mean? Obligation? Obligate means? It's like they can't use oxygen at all. Yes, they like by, they necessarily must be anaerobic. So those, there are certain organisms that live only in like places where there's no access to oxygen. So their only means of breaking down foods or sugars or whatever is by fermentation, right? So those are obligate anaerobes, but a lot of organisms are called facultative anaerobes, meaning they can use oxygen if it's there, but if it's not there, they can still undergo, so they, they can still undergo fermentation, right? So those are facultative anaerobes. So um, for example, Examples of facultative anaerobes are like yeast. Do you guys know you guys know what yeast are? Yeast is, right? It's a type of what type of kingdom? What kingdom is yeast in? We talked about this when we talked about the kingdom for a day. No? Um, yeast are a type of fungi. Yeah. Right? Okay, good. And then plants, you guys obviously know what plants are. When yeast and plants undergo fermentation, meaning that they're like deprived of oxygen. Um, they will break down sugar into um, ethanol, which is basically like alcohol, right? So that's why, where do we get like alcoholic beverages? Basically from the fermentation of yeast, right? For like, um, uh, for like you know, beer um, and like making, you know, alcohol, they use yeast. And they use some plants um, to make like, you know, some other like, you know, hard alcohols and stuff. But basically, because that's because their byproduct that they create is ethanol, right? Is alcohol. What about human beings? Like when we don't have oxygen, what happens to us? Do we just like not function or think about like when you're running really fast or something or using like, ex like exerting a lot of energy, what happens to your body? Like when that happens, when, when you're like running a lot, and maybe you're not used to running that much or well first of all when people run they obviously like breathe heavier right so they can get more oxygen to their cells because their cells are using up the you know the the supplies and then they want to produce the energy to get you to keep running right but um so that's why you know like obviously our breath in like take deeper and faster breaths right 
Um, but also like you can't always keep up with the demands on your body. So what happens is you start to get cramps. Have you got, you know, like you get cramps in your side when you're running or something because your body doesn't get enough oxygen to those cells. So those cells actually start undergoing fermentation because they need something, but they don't have the oxygen to help them get that, you know, to break it down. So they actually break, break the sugar down into lactic acid, which is like what causes cramps in your, um, in your body, right? Bacteria also can produce lactic uh, acid, right? Um, when they when they undergo fermentation, right? Okay, and so this is this whole process is considered anaerobic, okay? And then this whole process, this root is considered aerobic. All right, do you get that? All right, so I want you guys to watch this video. I think this video like does it really well. It's like. And we can watch, like, we can pause the video and watch it a How few times. How do you turn that bite of food into a chemical that I think that it's like they, they do it in a very, like, sort of, like, digestible way. And they, they show, like, all the molecules that are produced. So it really helps. Um, anyway, so here, here's the... How do you turn that bite of food into a chemical that a cell can recognize and use as energy? The first step is altering the food into its component chemical compounds and then getting those molecules into your cells. That process is called digestion. Once inside your cells, the process of turning that bite of food into useful energy by cellular respiration begins. The process of digestion results with carbohydrates and other molecules being removed from the consumed food and transported into the bloodstream. From there, nutrients like the carbohydrate glucose will leave the bloodstream through a capillary wall and enter a tissue cell. Do you guys remember which hormone allows glucose to go into the cells and out of the bloodstream? Which hormone does that? Anyone? Uh oh. Insulin? Yes. Very good. Thank you. Once inside the cell, cellular respiration will completely oxidize the glucose molecule, releasing high energy electrons. The overall goal is to make ATP, a storage form of energy for most cells. Cellular respiration is a four-stage process that begins with glycolysis. Glycolysis literally means splitting sugars, and it is the first step of cellular respiration occurring in the cytoplasm of the cell. So you need to know that it happens in the cytoplasm, glycolysis does, right? And remember, all things undergo glycolysis, right? Um, even if they're, they can't, if there's no oxygen, they all still do glycolysis in the cytoplasm of the cell. Glycolysis consists of two distinct phases, an energy investment phase and an energy harvesting phase. In the energy investment phase, two ATP molecules transfer energy to the glucose molecule, forming a six carbon sugar diphosphate molecule. This molecule splits and the energy harvesting phase begins. During this phase, the two three-carbon molecules are converted to pyruvate and ATP is formed. Glycolysis is a 10-step reaction that involves the activity of multiple enzymes and enzyme assistance. In the process, a net of two molecules of ATP, two molecules of pyruvate, and two high-energy electron-carrying molecules of NADH are produced. When oxygen is present, the pyruvate molecules and NADH enter the mitochondria and the next stage of cellular respiration begins. Okay. So we don't know what we think now. Um, is everything okay, Mike there? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, okay. So, <laughs> All right, so glycolysis, you guys don't need to know the 10 stops, the 10 steps of it, obviously, but you do need to know what goes into it. So we start out with, with, with what? We start out with glucose, right? That's the thing we're going to break down that we're going to lice, right? And then what do you think, what goes in at the beginning to kind of make glucose split? You have to attach, at first you have to invest two molecules of ATP, right? And so you kind of attach those on either side of a glucose molecule, which makes it actually unstable. So then it splits into two molecules. So if glucose like splits in half, how many, how many carbons are in glu glucose? 
Oh. Yeah, what are you doing? How many carbons are in glucose? Anyone? Six. Is All right. Six? So there are six. So if you divide that, if we split that in half, then there are going to be how many in each pyruvate? Three. Three. Three, right? So basically, you have a six molecule glucose molecule, right? Six six carbon glucose molecule. You add ATP, one for one on each side, let's say. Then we split it in half, right? And then we get two two like three carbon sugars, right? And then we then from that it produces four ATP total and two NADH. Okay, so you need to know. So the net gain of ATP is what? If you put in two, you get four, then what's the net gain? Yeah. Two, all right, so we're, we're gaining two, even though we had to put in two, we're getting four, so we get two out of it, and we get two NADHs, right? That's, you need to know that, okay? And at the end of glycolysis, we get the um, two pyruvate molecules, and then those go into the mitochondria for the next step, which is that pyruvate processing step, all right? Just making sure you're with me still. The next stage of cellular respiration involves the movement of pyruvate into the mitochondria, where it undergoes oxidation. Each pyruvate molecule is converted into a compound called acetyl-CoA. How many carbons does acetyl-CoA have here? Two. And how many carbons did each pyruvate have? Three. Three. Right, so where did that extra carbon go? Do you see those, these two carbons right here? These are two molecules of carbon dioxide. So actually in the process of creating pyru acetyl-CoA from pyruvate, in that processing step, you actually release two carbon dioxide and you get two more NADHs, right? In the process of pyruvate oxidation, electrons are transferred to NAD, producing NADH, and a carbon is lost, forming carbon dioxide. The next stage is the citric acid cycle. All right, did you guys all get that? You, you understand that processing step, right? She said like one carbon, one carbon dioxide, but she means per pyruvate molecule, right? So each pyruvate molecule has three carbons, and then during the processing step, it turns into acetyl-CoA, which is a two-carbon molecule, by giving off one carbon to make carbon dioxide, and then it gives off electrons to produce NADH, right? And this is, this is the next step, which is the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle. So what goes into the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle? What is this again? This is acetyl-CoA, acetyl -CoA, right? So if you say pyruvate goes into this, then that's not right, right? So make sure, yeah, acetyl-CoA, good. Cycle, also called the Krebs cycle. Here, acetyl-CoA will bind with a starting compound called oxaloacetate. I want you guys just to keep it, keep, um, keep track of the number of carbons, like follow these carbons around, because then you'll see how the form, this, this one, it's a cycle, just like the, the Calvin cycle. So you need to regenerate this four carbon sugar, this four carbon, sorry, this four carbon molecule, right? And you're going to have to release some of them into the atmosphere. So just keep track of like the number of carbons we have, right? So we're starting with this thing called oxaloacetate, right? And through a series of enzymatic redox reactions, all carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens in pyruvate ultimately end up as carbon dioxide and water. The pathway is called a cycle because oxaloacetate is the starting and ending compound of the pathway. For every glucose that enters glycolysis, the cycle completes twice once for each molecule of pyruvate that entered the mitochondria. During pyruvate oxidation and the citric acid cycle, a net of 8 NADH, 2 FADH2, 2 ATP, and 6 CO2 are produced for each glucose molecule. All right, are you guys following this? So here's, here's the NADH and the CO2 that were produced in the processing step. Right? So this is like, just ignore these over here. Okay? So now acetyl-CoA comes in, and how many carbons are in acetyl-CoA, each molecule of acetyl-CoA? Two. Two. And they're added to this four-carbon molecule, which is called oxaloacetate, 
So two, let's just treat one acetyl-CoA at a time, but we have two total, right? So one, the, those two carbons of, this, of acetyl-CoA get added to oxaloacetate, which makes how many carbon molecule? Six. A six carbon molecule, right? And then as that breaks down, so we get rid of one of the carbon molecules here and release one molecule of carbon dioxide here in the first step, right? And then one NADH is produced, okay? And then so now how many carbons do we have left then after we give away one to become carbon dioxide? We had six here, so now how many do we have here? Five. Five, right? And then here we give another carbon dioxide away, right? And then we make another NA, and in that process, by, by splitting that bond there, we're making another high energy electron carrier, right? So we're giving the, the energy that was broken here onto this energy carrier, NADH, right? Which is formed by from NAD, right? And then NAD accepts the electrons. So now it's reduced to get, um, and so, and then carbon dioxide is released. So now how many carbons are left over in this molecule here? Four. Four, right? So we're, we're back on track because we want to get back to four here, right? But before that can become like the, what was be, what, what happened in the beginning, it still has to release some more energy, right? So it produces one more ATP in this step right here. And then it produces an FADH2 in this step here. And then it produces one more NADH in this step here. And then we have oxaloacetate again. And then the other acetyl-CoA can come in. Again, it adds its two carbons to it to form this six carbon intermediate. And then it releases CO2 and NADH in the first step, making a five carbon compound left over, releases another carbon and another NADH to produce the four carbon one, ATP, FADH2, and then NADH. And then we're back to the cycle again, okay? Are you guys with me? All right, do you wanna watch this again, like this part again? Or no, are you good? I'm just gonna play it one more time because I think it does help to watch this. Okay. So here's our, this is what we came, this is what came out of the pyruvate processing step. How many of these did we get from the pyruvate process? Pyruvate processing step though? We have two of these, right? For every glucose molecule. So that means that this cycle is gonna happen twice for every glucose molecule, right? Okay, and then this, what, what is this called again? The four molecule, the four carbon, Compound that is the first actor or like um, thing in the Krebs cycle. This is called oxaloacetate, right? All right, just watch it again. This Here, acetyl CoA will bind with a starting compound called oxaloacetate. And through a series of enzymatic redox reactions, all carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens in pyruvate ultimately end up as carbon dioxide and water. The pathway is called a cycle because oxaloacetate is the starting and ending compound of the pathway. For every glucose that enters glycolysis, the cycle completes twice, once for each molecule of pyruvate that entered the mitochondria. During pyruvate oxidation and the citric acid cycle, a net of 8 NADH, 2 FADH2, two ATP and six CO2 are produced for each glucose molecule. And they're taught, they're including those six CO2s because they're including the six, the two that were produced in the processing step, right? So here are the NADH here. So how many NADH total? Including, if you include the processing step, we get six CO2, right? We get two, four, six, eight NADH, and two FAD H two plus two FAD H twos and then two ATPs. All right, are you guys all with me? In order to understand how the majority of the energy is produced by aerobic respiration, we need to follow the NADH and FADH two molecules to the next stage, the electron transport chain. Okay, um, should we stop there, or do you guys want to just like? Do this all today and then have all of tomorrow to work on the project. What do you think? We have nine more minutes. Can we finish it today? All right. I'm just going to finish it today. And then tomorrow you'll have the whole time to work on your project. Okay. All right. Let's just do it. So now at FADH2 and then NADH, they take the electrons that they got from that reaction and they're taking it to the electron transport chain. 
The electron transport chain is a series of membrane-bound carriers in the mitochondria that pass electrons from one to another. What does this remind you of? I hope you say photosynthesis. I hope you say the light reactions of photosynthesis, right? So, cause this is all in the membrane of the mitochondria. Okay. And then the, this one, what do you think this is? What does that look kind of like? ATP synthase. Yes, exactly. And this is what's going to happen. The same thing. So we're going to form a gradient as we're passing the energy down here. We're going to form the hydrogen proton gradient again. And then ATP is going to, the hydrogen protons are going to run through here and then we're going to produce ATP again. So this is just, but in this case, the carriers, instead of chlorophyll molecules, you know, being excited and having the electrons transported like that, NADH and FADH2 are the ones that deliver their, their, pro, their electrons to the chain. Okay. As the electrons are transferred between the membrane proteins, here are the, the electrons. cell is able to capture energy and use it to produce ATP molecules. See? Proteins in the chain pump hydrogen ions across a membrane. When the hydrogen ions flow back across the membrane through an ATP synthase complex, ATP is synthesized by the enzyme ATP synthase. Flow back across. All right, you guys, I want you to watch the, the flow of. And use as, e as these electrons are going by, I want you to watch the, the protons, all right? What, watch where the protons are, what the protons are doing and where they're being actively pumped and then where they're being passively like facilitating, you know, facilitated diffusion is happening, right? So watch, here's the, the electrons. electrons, look at the protons here. See, they're the getting pumped here. Proteins. More protons getting pumped through, right? Energy more protons getting pumped ATP through, molecules. right? So protons now there's a gradient. The so they want to come back across a membrane. through here, right? And what's when happening the when they're coming back through here? Back across the membrane ATP, through an ATP is getting made, complex. right? ATP is synthesized See? by the enzyme ATP synthase. Oxygen acts as the terminal electron acceptor. So again, here we're tracing the, 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 the electrons going down, getting passed from protein to protein to protein to protein. And then here, oxygen comes in and, um, and acts as the final electron receptor. What was the final electron receptor in photosynthesis in the light reactions? NADP plus. Yes, NADP plus. But in this case, NAD, uh, sorry, oxygen is the final electron. So that's why we need oxygen for this process to occur, right? That's why it's aerobic. Um, if there are no oxygen, you can't do this stuff. So then that, that's why fermentation has to happen. But yeah, ec uh, the final electron receptor is oxygen and oxygen re receives the electrons, um, which are essentially like, um, you know, and then it combines it with the protons, you know, one electron, one proton, makes a hydrogen atom, right? And then, so hydrogen plus oxygen is water. So this is where the water part of, of like um, respiration comes. By accepting electrons, oxygen is reduced. See, here's oxygen right here. A byproduct See? of the electron transport chain. And there's two molecules All of water the there. the high right? energy electron carriers from the previous stages of cellular respiration bring their electrons into Here's the, the oxygen. Chain. See the oxygen, the protons, the electrons, the ATP and then we get the hydrogen and the oxygen. Respiration right? is produced. A net of 32 to 36 ATP. So how many ATP net were formed in glycolysis? Net. ATP. How many were put in in glycolysis? Two were put in, four were came out. So how many net do we or do we gain in glycolysis? Yeah. Huh? No. So we put in two in glycolysis. We got out four. So how many oh. net did we gain? Oh, I thought you said you oh. put in four and you get out four. So then, yes, you gain two. You gain two in glycolysis, right? And then how many do we gain from the citric acid cycle? for each molecule of glucose? Two. Two, right? And then how many do we gain in the electron transport chain? 32 to 36. So which one is clearly like the most efficient, like um, energy producing process? Like which, which part obviously makes the most of the ATP, the electron transport chain, right? 
so yeah, like those organisms that like can only do fermentation, like, you know, they're making a few ATP, but it's not going to get them very far. Whereas like, you know, ones that can undergo, undergo cellular respiration really have an advantage because they have so much more ATP, like able to be produced. Right. So you need to know that too, like which one is like, you know, in summary, most, we have seen how the four stages of cellular ATP. respiration are responsible for converting the energy found in the glucose molecule into ATP. All right. So notice again, here's the glucose that comes into the cell. Here's the, um, the cytoplasm. So glyc glycolysis happens in the cytoplasm. Then it enters the products, pyruvate, enter the mitochondria. The pyruvates are oxidized or processed inside the mitochondria, right? And then um, the citric acid cycle also happens inside the mitochondrial matrix. And then the electron transport chain happens on the inner mitochondrial membrane between the in inner matrix here and then the outer matrix, which is right here. And um, the ATP is made as it in, in the inside the, in the inner matrix because the hydrogen protons are, you know, the, are pumped out across the membrane as the electrons are banding passed down and then they flow back in through facilitated fusion through ATP synthase and then ATP is made inside the mitochondria matrix, okay? The energy battery of the cell. On average, 36 ATP molecules are produced per glucose molecule that entered the cell. In the process of producing ATP, Oxygen is brought in from the bloodstream to be the final electron acceptor in the electron transport chain. And the carbon dioxide that is produced as a byproduct is released. The goal of cellular respiration is to transfer the energy from the food that we eat daily into ATP that our bodies can use. This process starts with the eating of a snack or meal and ends with capturing the energy from the complete breakdown of the nutrients into energy and carbon dioxide. Okay, that's a great video. I really love, I love the way they do it. Like, they, you know, it's not too, um, they don't make it too crazy, but I think they really break it down into each step and like it's clear like where each, you know, thing is. So I don't know, I really like that video. Um, and that's about the, the, the level of the detail that I want you to, you know, know it. At. But, you know, obviously when you're seniors, you're going to have to do all this stuff again. And I think Mr. Temsik is going to hold you responsible for the 10 steps of glycolysis and then like each intermediate in the Krebs cycle. So I don't know. Um, but it, this is a good overview. Uh, all right. So listen, so tomorrow we will not have a live class. You guys will. So your task is, you know, I, I want you to, you can, we can work in groups. Um, you can work in groups of up to three, right? I don't want like more than three people in a group because I think then that would be a little too, you know, I don't know if it would be that effective. Um, you can work in groups of three, you can work alone, you can work in groups of two, right? And what I, the, the, the point is, I want you to produce something that we can all share that proves your knowledge of, it can be cellular respiration, it can be photosynthesis, it can be comparing them, um, anything you want. Right. But it has to be something that, you know, that shows can't just be like, oh, cellular respiration and photosynthesis are opposites. And, you know, you know, it, and it can't be too similar to my PowerPoint itself. Like, obviously, it needs to be accurate, but I want you to try to choose a different way to sh to help people remember it and just to show that you understand what's involved in that process. OK, it's very free. You can make you know, you can make a you know, you can make a slideshow, you can make a video, you can make a song, you can make a picture, you know, you can make a skit, you can do like whatever you want, but it has to have some sort of quality involved that shows that you understood this material. Okay. Pretty flexible, right? Do you guys understand what I want you to do? Yeah. Okay. And I want you to, I want, I'm going to have you sign in just on a, on a Google doc. Cause I want to know who's working with whom and what to expect. All right. I'm not going to, um, you know, monitor you guys, um, doing your group work tomorrow, but you have the whole period tomorrow, you know, our period. I want you to sign in on attendance. You need to sign in so that you get credit for the day, like being present. Don't make me chase you down. Just you know, sign in at right at 1130 as usual, and then say like present here, whatever. And then, you know, you guys, but you know, it's free, you're free to work on, 
your project, you know, whatever time is convenient for all of you guys. It, I don't expect like a, you know, a really like sophisticated, like crazy, you know, like in depth, um, you know, I don't want a research paper, right? But I want something that just, you know, shows a little bit of like, you know, how you understand what what's going on in, in cellular respiration, because I'm not going to give you a quiz on it. But I need to show that I need to see that you still understand. You can make a game for everyone to do. You can make quiz questions for everyone else to take. You know, you can, you know, it's, it's really, really up to you. Okay. But you have to do something. Right. And I has to, you know, I have to be able to say, okay, this clearly shows that these students understand this concept and then I'll give you the credit, but you know, make it, we can make it fun for everyone. You can make it hard for everyone. You can torture everyone by giving them all quiz questions. Like instead of me giving the quiz questions, you can, you know, see how everyone does on your quiz. I mean, you know, whatever, but obviously like your answers, your intended answers for the quiz obviously need to be right as well. If you make a quiz for everyone, right. It can be a game. It can be, you know, interactive, um, try to make it, you know, interesting, interactive if you can. All right. And so we'll be doing these, preparing them tomorrow, presenting them on, on Wednesday. Okay. And if for some reason, you know, you're not available on Wednesday, I think some people, someone said that they weren't available on Wednesday to be in class. Um, if you can't be in class like live, then make sure your contribution to the group, you know, is somehow um, included. Like if it's a video, you know, maybe you could, you make sure that you appear on the video or if it's like a, you know, presentation, make sure you, you know, have contributed enough so your group doesn't feel like you just abandoned them or anything. All right. Does anyone have any questions? No. All right. This is the last thing. I'm, I hope it like kind of takes a little like, you know, off your plate because I want you to, and I'll post the PowerPoint for this um, right now. Okay. Questions? No. Okay. All right. So I'll see you guys sign in tomorrow. At 11.30, please don't be too late, all right? And then um, I'll see you on Wednesday at our normal time, and you'll present these, okay? All right. Okay, bye, then, thank you. All right, bye, guys. Lee Do. Bye, thank you. Yeah, bye, thank you. I was so going to just ask you a question. Yeah, yeah. Do you just want me to create, a, like, a just a private message? And yeah, then... I have – you and I have a uh, – we have a chat going on, I think, right? We have, like, a separate conversation, I think, right now. Uh, Anyway? I'm not sure. Yeah, I think yeah, so. Yeah.